Amen. Our Father, we thank you for our Bible story today. We bless your name for bringing us together. Thank you for the great privilege of studying your word. We're asking, O oh Lord, that this great privilege you have given us will not be taken away from us in Jesus' name. Give us eyes to see, ears to hear, hearts to understand, and give us a passionate desire that what you reveal to us as our inheritance, as you promised for us, will passionately desire and ask and pray and receive in Jesus' name. We pray that our coming here today will not be in vain. Thank you, Lord, for the privilege. In Jesus' name, we pray. I welcome every one of you once again to our Bible study. If you are coming for the first time, I rejoice with you. You made a good choice. Coming here today to study the Word of God. Studying the Word of God gives you a backbone to your Christian life. And those who are negligent in studying the Bible, even though they may say they are born again, they will have straw for backbone. And when the wind blows, it easily blows them away. And they are blown off their ground. They are not able to stand. Because the thing that makes us stable, stabilized, solid, is the study of the Word of God. And here in our church, for the benefit of those who are coming for the first time, we study line upon line, precept upon precept. We just go from one book to the other, and one chapter to the other, from verse after verse after verse, so that we'll not omit anything. And so that the whole revelation of the Word of God that is revealed unto us, we explain, we expound, we apply, we endeavor to understand, so that our lives will be based on the full, complete totality of the Word of God. For some weeks, we've been studying Joel. And I'm now in Joel, we're in the third study of the prophecy of Joel. Joel chapter 2. We're still looking at verses 28 and 29. You'll see the reason why. I'm looking at verse 28, and it shall come to pass, afterward that I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. And your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. And your old men shall dream dreams. And your young men shall see visions. Also upon the servants and upon the handmaids. In those days will I pour out my spirit. The Holy Spirit is important. The Holy Spirit is indispensable. And the Holy Spirit is central in the plan of God, in the work of God. Go back to the time of the creation. The Holy Spirit was there. Come back to the time of recreation, redemption of man. The Holy Spirit is active. He is central in everything. In the creation of the world, even in the upholding of the world by the power of God. The Holy Spirit is central. We can say then, from the commencement to the consummation of all things, the Holy Spirit is central. And none of us shall be ignorant of the works, the operations, and the ministry of the Holy Spirit as central, as important, as indispensable. The work of the Holy Spirit is, it is not surprising that God has given us the promise to pour out the Spirit upon us. And I need to tell you this, such a promise it's not only found in Joel. It's given in, other, in the other books of the Old Testament. I want you to follow me now. And look at this word, Paul. I'm sure you understand. And when the mother is bathing the child and has washed the child, cleansed the child, and a lot of water remains in the bucket, and the mother takes that bucket and pours on that child. It is the climax of the event. 
And you see the joy in that child. And the Holy Spirit is giving to us one in the emblem of water. And the Lord is saying, I'm going to pour the water of the Spirit upon you. And what refreshing we have. What renewal we have. What revival we have. When the Holy Spirit like water is poured upon us. I need to tell you that the Holy Spirit is symbolized also by oil. And when the oil is taken, you must remember, as Samuel came to Jesus' house, and then he wants to anoint a priest, a king. And then he took the oil and anointed him, poured the oil on him. And as the New Testament tells us, the believer is a priest, the believer is supposed to be a prophet, and the believer is supposed to be a priest. We're kings and princes to the Lord, and the Lord is saying, to make us to be able to stand in the place he wants us to stand. is going to pour the oil of the spirit on us. He's not just going to make a mark of the oil on our forehead. He'll take the bottle of oil, so to say, and pour it upon us. The Holy Spirit is symbolized by the emblem of fire. And you know, when we are being cold, lethargic, lukewarm and it's like we're sluggish no passion no zeal and everything is just just, just dragging and then the spirit of god fire poured upon us spirit soul and body and it quickens us and there is a passion that comes into your life i will pour the fire of the holy ghost upon you you understand then as we look at the scriptures, and we see that he gives us the promise, I will pour. Do you see, do you realize, in those two verses I read to you, he uses the word pour in verse 28. He uses the word pour in verse 29. Look at it, Joel chapter 2, verse 28. And it shall come to pass afterward, that I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. Verse 29. Also, upon my servants and upon my handmaids in those days. Look at the word again. Will I pour out my spirit? As you centralize, you center, you focus on that word, pour. And you understand the significance of the word, pour. And the importance of you staying. Steady there, and then the Lord just pours the Holy Ghost upon you. And what change it will make in your life. I told you that it's not only in, it's not only in. Joel, come on to Isaiah, chapter 44, verse 3. For I will pour water upon him that is thirsty, and flood upon the dry ground. Here is it. I will pour my spirit upon thy seed and my blessing upon thy offspring. And you will see the, all the connections. It says, I'm going to just pour out and pour out and pour out. Well, the outpouring of the spirit of God comes the outpouring of refreshing and renewal. I'll pour water upon him that is thirsty. And there will be floods. And that means there will be revitalization. The desert will become like the Garden of Eden. And then I'm going to pour my blessings upon thy seed. The outpouring of the Spirit of God upon the people of God. In Ezekiel. Ezekiel chapter 39. Reading there in verse 29. Ezekiel 39, 29. Neither. Will I hide my face anymore from them? For I have poured out my spirit upon the house of Israel. Says the Lord God is telling us that without pouring of the spirit of God will come the perpetual presence and power of the Lord upon our lives. I will not hide my face anymore from them. The moment I pour my spirit upon them. My presence, my power will remain 
permanently with them. In Proverbs chapter 1. Proverbs chapter 1, verse 23. Turn you at my reproof. Behold, I will pour out my spirit unto you. I will make known my words unto you. And see the promise here, but it is a condition here. Before he pours the spirit upon us, it says we must have ears to listen. And if he corrects us, reproves us, we turn at the reproof of the Lord. Turn you at my reproof. Then he says, if you fulfill that condition and you get rid of anything that offends me, anything that contradicts my will, anything that goes against my pleasure, if you turn at my reproof, behold, I will pour out my spirit unto you. And then he says, there's a consequence of that. You will not be ignorant of my will. You will not be ignorant of my word. You will not be ignorant of my plan. If I pour my spirit upon you, I will make my words known unto you. Actually, you see, uh, when, the, when you have the outpouring of the Spirit of God, when God Almighty shows you this favor and He fulfills this promise in your life, there are consequences, there are results, there are rewards, there are great things that come upon your life as a result. In Isaiah chapter 32, reading from verse 15, Isaiah chapter 50, 32, verse 15. Until the Spirit be poured upon us from on high, and the wilderness be a fruitful field, and the fruitful field be counted for a forest, then judgment shall dwell, justice shall dwell in the wilderness, and righteousness shall remain in the fruitful field, and the work of righteousness shall be peace. And the effect of righteousness, quietness, and assurance forever. See that. See that. A wonderful blessing that the Lord pours upon us, that he gives unto us. If we keep on seeking the Lord, seeking the Lord until, until that time when he pours his spirit upon us, will be fruitful. There will be righteousness. The promises of the Lord will be yes and amen for us. There will be quietness. Trouble. Rioting. Discord. Lack of peace. Everything will come to an end. And there will be an assurance. Not a temporary assurance. It will be a permanent assurance. An assurance that comes forever and ever. And that's the reason why it's so important. We know what the scripture is saying. And what the scripture is teaching us about this promise of the Lord. The outpouring of the Spirit. But you know, we need to go step, one step after the other. That's why we're not jumping into the baptism in the Holy Ghost. Yeah, that's why we're preparing the ground. And we're going step after step, study after study. Until we get to that place where the mighty outpouring of the Spirit of God comes upon the waiting believer. And you know, if you study the life of Jesus Christ, he was given, he gave this same promise. And he himself was full of the Holy Ghost and everything he did, he did by the Holy Spirit. And you remember the history of the church? The church was full of the Spirit at the beginning. And I need to tell you that the church will be prepared for the coming of the Lord by the Holy Spirit. I invite you to study with me tonight. As we look at the study, the centrality of the Holy Spirit's ministry. Three points in the study. Number one, 
the anointing. Number two, the action. Number three, the agreement. Number one, the anointing of the Spirit on the Savior. Number two, the action of the Spirit in our salvation. Number three, the agreement of the Spirit and the Scriptures. They never disagree. The Spirit and the Scripture. The agreement of the Spirit and the Scripture. Come back to number one. The anointing of the Spirit on the Savior. Our Lord Jesus Christ was conceived of the Holy Ghost, the Holy Spirit. And throughout his life, he was under the great anointing of the Holy Spirit. His mediatory work was done in the power of the Spirit of God. It was done by the help of the Spirit of God. His preaching, his healing, his deliverance, his sacrifice, the giving of himself, the giving of his life for us, the transformation he produces in our lives, and the way he upholds us by his grace and power. Everything, everything from conception to Calvary to the time he surrendered his life for your salvation, for my salvation. Everything was done through the eternal spirit. Look at it. Hebrews chapter 9. Hebrews chapter 9, verse 14. How much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God? Here he tells us in the middle of that verse that Christ, through the eternal spirit, that's the Holy Spirit, through the help of the spirit, through the sustenance of the spirit, through the encouragement of the spirit, through the support of the spirit, he offered himself without spot unto God. Uh, you'll remember how the devil tempted him. And you remember Gethsemane. You remember bearing the cross. You remember, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? You remember the tears and the sweat. And you remember the agony and the suffering. How did he go through everything? And he was able to remain on that cross for your salvation, for my salvation. Through the eternal spirit, he offered himself without spot to God. And it's as a result of that suffering now, the blood of Jesus Christ now can purge our conscience from dead works so that we will be able to serve the living God. And that's what he did for salvation. And he did it by the help of the Spirit of the Lord. In Romans chapter 1, talking about the anointing of the Spirit on the Savior. Romans chapter 1, reading from verse 3. You'll see the relationship between Jesus Christ, the Son of God, and the Holy Ghost, the Holy Spirit. Romans 1, 3, concerning His Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, which was made... Of the seed of David according to the flesh. And declared to be the son of God with power. Listen to this. According to the spirit of holiness. By the resurrection from the dead. Can we, say, can we get saved without believing in the resurrection of the Lord? If thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus. That he died for you. And that God raised him from the dead. And you believe that in your heart, thou shalt be saved. That resurrection from the dead. It was by the power of the Spirit of God. That's why it says, 
He is declared to be the Son of God with power according to the spirit of holiness. Do you see the way the Holy Spirit is referred to now? Look up here. Holy Spirit. Spirit. That's a noun. Holy. That's an adjective qualifying the Spirit. Telling us the characteristic of the Spirit. Holy Spirit. But now he changes it around. If it's Holy Spirit, he is the Spirit of holiness. The same thing. And he's declared to be the Son of God according to the Spirit of holiness by the resurrection from the dead. By whom we have received grace and apostleship for obedience to the faith among all nations for his name. Tells us then that uh, the, the Spirit of God was upon the Lord Jesus Christ. And it is by that Spirit he did he accomplished all things he accomplished for us, for you and for me. In John chapter 3, verse 34 and verse 32, verse 36. John chapter 3, verse 34. For he whom God has sent speaketh the words of God. For God giveth not the Spirit by measure unto him. Uh, that means that uh, God just poured out the Spirit unto the Lord Jesus Christ without measure. Unlimited. And then it tells us it is that Jesus Christ that has come to save us. The Father loveth the Son and has given him all things, has given all things to his Son. He that believeth on the Son has everlasting life. He that believeth not the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abideth on him. Very clear then in the word of God that the Lord Jesus Christ had the Spirit upon him. And it is by the help and the power of the Spirit of God he was able to do what he did. Christ's work of redemption. How great it is. But to accomplish that great redemption, the Father gave unlimited measure of the Spirit's power, might and anointing unto him. As Satan tried to hinder the accomplishment of our redemption by all means. It came at Christ. It came against Christ. From the beginning of his ministry to the very end, he went until he went to the cross to die for the salvation of all men. But you know, every time he overcame and he paid the full price of our redemption until he was able to declare, it is finished. And the Holy Spirit helped him all the way through. In fact, the Old Testament predicted and prophesied that the Spirit of God will be upon the Redeemer. And it will be by the help and the power, the support, the anointing of the Spirit, he will be able to accomplish the redemption. In Isaiah chapter 11. Isaiah chapter 11. Reading there from verse 1. And there shall come forth a road out of the stem of Jesse. Speaking figuratively in a picture, a, with a language of picture, about the Lord Jesus Christ, and a branch shall grow. Out of his root, the spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him. The spirit of wisdom and understanding. The spirit of counsel and might. The spirit of knowledge and of the fear of the Lord. And shall make him of quick, sharp understanding in the fear of the Lord. And he shall not judge after the sight of his eyes, neither reprove after the hearing of his ears. That's talking about the Lord Jesus Christ. He said he'll have one, the Spirit of the Lord. Then he begins to tell us, uh, you know, some explanation, characteristics of the Spirit of the Lord. Um, it will be the Spirit of wisdom and the Spirit of understanding and the Spirit of counsel and the Spirit of might and the Spirit of knowledge and the Spirit of the fear of the Lord. And as all that helped the Lord 
in his ministry until he went to the cross. And of course, you know that Isaiah spoke about the redemption he accomplished for us. You see that in Isaiah chapter 53. Verse 1, was believed our report? And to whom is the arm of the Lord revealed? He's talking about our redemption. He's talking about the Redeemer. He's talking about our salvation. He's talking about our Savior. He's talking about the sacrifice of Christ. He's talking about the sufficiency of that sacrifice. And he says, those who are going to get saved, those who are going to get the benefit out of that redemptive work, they need to believe. That's why he's asking, is there anybody there who has believed our report? Anybody there that believes the report that we give of the Redeemer, the arm of the Lord, that's the power of the Lord, that's the might of the Lord, will be revealed unto him. For he, referring to Christ, the Redeemer, the Messiah, he shall grow up before him as a tender plant and as a root out of a dry ground. He has no form, no comeliness. And when we shall see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. He is despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And we that see it were our faces from him. He was despised and we esteemed him not. Surely he has borne our griefs, carried our sorrows. Yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. And the chastisement of our peace was upon him. And with his stripes we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed. He was afflicted. Yet he opened not a smile. How did he have such patience? Such endurance? That everything they did to stop him from suffering, from going to the cross, from dying for us, did not stop him. And he opened not his mouth. By the power, by the help, by the support of the Spirit of God. He is brought as a lamb to the slaughter. And as a sheep before our shearers is dumb, so he opened not his mouth. He was taken from prison and from judgment. And who shall declare his generation? For he was cut off out of the land of the living. For the transgression of my people was he stricken. And he made his grave with the wicked and with the rich in his death. Because he has done no violence, neither was any deceit in his mouth. Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. He has put him to grief. When thou shalt make his soul an offering for sin, he shall see his seed. And he shall prolong his days. And the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. He shall see the, tra the travail of his soul and shall be satisfied. You know, even from the day of Pentecost, thousands of people being converted. And on and on and on, thousands and thousands and thousands of people. And then until this time, millions and billions of people from that time until now, you've seen the result. Of the travail of his soul. And now he is satisfied. By his knowledge shall my righteous servant justify many. For he shall bear their iniquity. Therefore will I divide him a portion with the great. And he shall divide his spoil with the strong. Because he has poured out his soul unto them. And he was numbered with the transgressors. And he bare the sin of many. And made intercession for the transgressors. Uh, you see everything that the Lord did for our redemption and the Lord Jesus Christ, he appeared in the temple. I've read to you, I've read two references from Isaiah. And actually, much is written about Christ in the prophecy of Isaiah in Luke chapter 4. 
Luke chapter 4. And there we see that the Spirit of God was mighty upon him. Verse 1, Jesus being full of the Holy Ghost, returned from Jordan and was led by the Spirit into the wilderness. In verse 14, and Jesus returned in the power of the Spirit into Galilee. He was to begin his ministry now. And he had the Spirit upon him. And then we're told in verse 16, he came to Nazareth where he had been brought up. And as his custom was, he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and stood up for to read. And there was delivered unto him the book of the prophet Isaiah. Isaiah. And when he had opened the book, he found a place where it was written, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. And the preaching of the gospel, to prepare them to believe so they can be saved, is by the Spirit of the Lord. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted and to preach deliverance to the captives and recovering of sight to the blind and to set at liberty them that are bruised. You see very clearly then that it was through the anointing of the Spirit that the Savior did everything in the ministry and went to the cross to die for us. Number two, the action of the Spirit in our salvation. The action of the Spirit in our salvation. As we recognize the anointing of the Holy Spirit on our Savior, we also need to acknowledge the action of the Holy Spirit in our individual salvation. The Father is very actively involved in the salvation of every individual. The Lord Jesus Christ, of course, is actively involved in the salvation of every individual because he seeks everyone individually to bring us individually to the Father. I came to seek and to save that which was lost. And then the Holy Spirit now, you know what he does? He arranges all circumstances so that he can draw us to the point of hearing the word, draws to the point of praying and asking for salvation from the Father through the Lord Jesus Christ. L let me just show you some few examples in Acts of the Apostles chapter 8. And see the involvement of the Holy Spirit in orchestrating, arranging, directing all the circumstances leading to the salvation of individuals. Acts chapter 8 from verse 29 Acts 8 29 then the spirit said unto Philip that's the Holy Spirit go near join thyself to this chariot and Philip ran thither to him and heard him read the prophet Isaiah and said understandest thou what thou readest and he said how can I accept someone shall guide me and he desired Philip that he should he would come up and sit with him. The place of the scripture which he read was this. That's what we read in Isaiah chapter 53. He was led as a sheep to the slaughter. And like a lamb dumb before his sharers, he opened not his mouth. In his humiliation, his judgment was taken away. And who shall declare his generation? For his life is taken from the earth. And you know, consult Philip and said, I pray thee, I plead with you, I beg you, I beseech you, of whom speaketh the prophet this, of himself, or of some other man. Then Philip opened his mouth and began at the same scripture and preached unto him Jesus. See what the Spirit has done? The Spirit of God made that man to be reading the exact scripture that will lead him to salvation. And the Spirit of God brought the evangelist and brought him to the right spot where that man was. And the Spirit of God made the man to say, made the Philip to say, do you understand? And the man said, how can I understand? And he said, 
it looks like you can explain things. Come up here and come and sit with me in the chariot. See what the Spirit of the Lord directed, orchestrated, arranged for this man to hear the gospel and be born again. And as they went in verse 36 on their way, they came unto a certain water, and the eunuch said, See, here is water. What does hinder me to be baptized? And Philip said, If thou believest with all thine heart, thou mayest. And he said, I, He answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And he commanded the chariot to stand still. And they went down both into the water. And both Philip and the eunuch. And he baptized him. And when, listen to this, listen to this. And when they were come up out of the water. What's the next word? What's the next word? The Spirit of the Lord caught away Philip. And the eunuch saw him no more. And he went on his way rejoicing. The joy of the Lord. The man was saved. And the Spirit of God said, that's why I brought you there. You are finished. That's what I'm directing. That's what I'm controlling. I'm involved in the salvation of every individual. That is not. And he took him away from there. The Spirit of the living God is involved in the salvation of every individual. In Acts of the Apostles, chapter 10, verses 19 and 20. While Peter thought on this vision, the Spirit said unto him, Behold, three men seek thee. Arise, therefore, and get thee now, and go with them, doubting nothing. For I, that's the Spirit of God, I have sent them. And as the Spirit of God organizing everything, arranging everything so that Cornelius and his household will hear the fullness of the gospel. And the fullness of Christian experiences will come upon a south. And that's why uh, when the uh, Jews, uh, when they were asking, they wanted to know how could Peter go to that place, to the Gentiles. See what he said. In Acts chapter 11 verse 12. And the Spirit bade me go with them, doubting nothing. Oh, he said, hey, you think it's what I want to do? Am I not a Jew like you're a Jew? Did I not even argue with the Lord and said, Nothing unclean has ever entered my mouth? Do you think I would have gone? Why it not for the Spirit of the living God? That is involved in bringing everyone individually to salvation and the fullness of salvation. And then in Acts of the Apostles chapter 13, verse 2. And as a minister to the Lord and fasted, the Holy Ghost said, Separate me, Barnabas and Saul, for the work whereunto I have called them. But for so they, being sent forth by the Holy Ghost, de departed unto Seleucia. And from thence they sailed to Cyprus. And again, salvation of the Gentiles began. Conversion of the Gentiles began. Because the Holy Spirit was interested, and is still interested, in the salvation of individuals. Acts chapter 15 verse 3. And being brought on their way by the church. They passed through Phenicia and Samaria. Declaring the conversion of the Gentiles. And they caused great joy unto all the brethren. That's why the Spirit of the Lord sent out Barnabas and Saul. For the conversion of the Gentiles. You can see then the involvement of the Spirit of the Lord. The action of the Spirit in our salvation. 1 Thessalonians chapter 1. 1 Thessalonians chapter 1. I'm looking at verses 5 and 6. For our gospel came not unto you in word only, but also in power, and in the Holy Ghost, and in much assurance, as ye know what manner of men we were, 
among you for your sake. And ye became followers of us and of the Lord, having received the word in much affliction with joy, the joy of the Holy Ghost, so that ye were examples to all that believe in Macedonia and Achaia. Again, you will see the involvement of the Holy Ghost, the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of God in the salvation, the conversion of these people in Thessalonica. In uh, Hebrews chapter 2, verses 3 and 4. Hebrews chapter 2, verses 3 and 4. How shall we escape if we neglect so great salvation, which at the first began to be spoken by the Lord, and was confirmed unto us by them that heard him? How did they preach that word? In what authority, in what name, in what power did they preach that word? How was the word so effective on them that they became saved, born again, and that great salvation became theirs? God, verse 4, also bearing with them witness, both with signs and wonders and with diverse miracles and gifts of the Holy Ghost according to his own will. And that's how they believed. That's how they spoke the word. And because the Holy Spirit took that word, directed that word to the hearts of men and women that heard, they came under conviction. And then they were led to pray. They repented of their sins. And the Holy Ghost assisted them and helped them to believe. And they were converted. First Corinthians chapter 2 verse 12. First Corinthians chapter 2 verse 12. Now we have received... Not the spirit of the world, but the spirit which is of God, that we might know the things that are freely given to us of God. And that's how individuals know that salvation belongs to them. That's how individuals know that they can be saved. That salvation has been freely given unto each one by the spirit of the living God. In verse 13, which things? Also we speak, not in words which man's word, which man's wisdom teaches, but which the Holy Ghost teaches, comparing spiritual things with spiritual things. Can you see then that in the scriptures? The Holy Spirit led the evangelists and the preachers of the gospel to individuals so that they can be given the opportunity to hear the gospel of salvation that will lead them to experience the new birth, the specific action of the Holy Spirit leading individuals to salvation and leading preachers or evangelists or soul winners to other individuals to be saved, that action of the Spirit still continues today. Our own human actions alone and the human actions of the believers alone and the preachers alone, they are not enough to lead us to salvation. The Holy Spirit is the unseen guide, leading individuals to situations where they can hear the gospel of salvation. Then he convicts the sinner of his sins. He leads him to pray, leads him to believe, and leads him to experience transformation through the Lord Jesus Christ. And when that salvation is experienced, it is that Holy Spirit when the work is accomplished that tells that sinner, your sins are forgiven. Bears witness with the heart that now you are a child of God. Romans chapter 8, verse 16. The Spirit itself beareth witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. I come now to point number three. The agreement of the Spirit and the Scripture. The agreement of the spirit and the scripture. And what an important part of our study today. Uh, you know, uh, there are some people that believe that when you have the Holy Spirit, you'll become wild. You do wild things. Unreasonable things. Things you cannot explain. Uh, you know, there are people that believe that uh, the, the Holy Ghost makes you eccentric. It makes you to behave in an irrational way. And you find some people, they say they have the Holy Ghost, 
And he thinks the deal so unreasonable and so irrational. And if you try to show them the Bible, they say, you know what? The Holy Ghost just took over. And the Holy Ghost just moved me. And it's the Holy Ghost that made me to do irrational, eccentric, unreasonable things. My brothers and sisters, I need to tell you, there is always agreement between the Spirit of God and the Scriptures of God. Between the Holy Spirit and the Holy Scriptures. The Holy Spirit and the Holy Scriptures never disagree. A Christian who is truly filled and controlled by the Holy Spirit will not contradict the Scriptures. And Christians who are led by the Holy Spirit will not do anything contrary to what the Scriptures teach. Will not act in any way contrary to the teaching of Scripture. Those who profess to have the Spirit and they say things that are condemned by the Scriptures. And they do things that are contrary to the Scriptures. They are not acting under the influence of the Holy Spirit. Such people, such preachers, are acting under the influence, maybe, of the human spirit or of a demonic spirit. Look at this. In Second Samuel, chapter 23, I want you to see the, uh, the closeness, the relationship, the interaction, the agreement between the Holy Spirit and the Holy Scriptures. Uh, between the Spirit of God and the Word of God. In Second Samuel chapter 23, verse 2. The Spirit of the Lord spake by me, and His Word was in my tongue. Do you see that? The Spirit of the Lord. And immediately after that, He says, and His Word was in my tongue. When you find the Spirit of God, you find the Word of God, the Scriptures. In Proverbs chapter 1, Proverbs chapter 1, verse 23, you'll see the relationship and the closeness between the Spirit and the Scriptures. It says, Turn you at my reproof. Behold, I will pour my Spirit unto you, and I will make known my words unto you. See that? I'll pour my spirit upon you. And then immediately what follows is that I'll make my words known unto you. Actually, when you have the Holy Ghost, the greatest evidence continuing in your life is not shaking and trembling. It's not even speaking in tongues. And that's just the initial evidence. When you have the fullness of the Holy Ghost, the greatest evidence is that you will understand the word of God. I will make my words known unto you. The greatest evidence is that you are fenced around by that spirit of God and you are prevented from going into error, going into falsehood because the spirit of truth will make the truth of the scripture to be so much in your heart and any time there is false doctrine, Every time a false prophet, erroneous teacher is teaching, the Spirit of God will make you to know what is right and what is wrong. I'll pour my Spirit unto you, and then I will make my words known unto you. Isaiah chapter 59. Isaiah chapter 59. There in verse, 20, in verse 21, it says, As for me, this is my covenant with them, says the Lord. My spirit that is upon thee, and my word which I put in thy mouth. You see how they are joined together? My spirit upon you, and my words I put in your mouth, shall not depart out of thy mouth, nor out of the mouth of thy seed, nor out of the mouth of thy seed, seed, says the Lord. From his force and forever. Brothers and sisters, look up here. You know that. There are people, and some of us, because we are babes in Christ, 
we don't understand. And they say, you know, deeper life. If you are going to deeper life, the only thing is Bible, Bible, Bible. The word, the word, the word. And they say the only thing is just, you know, reading the Bible, studying the Bible, interpreting the Bible, explaining the Bible. The only thing is sound. Yes, we agree, we agree, we understand. Nobody can doubt. We know you deeper life people. As for sound doctrine, as for teaching, we know it's there. But, then they say, hey, the problem with deeper life is they don't give allowance to the Holy Ghost. How are we going to give allowance to the Holy Ghost? It's by the world. Where the Spirit is, the Scripture will be central. Where the Spirit of, the, of truth is, the truth of the Spirit will be abundant. And that's what he's saying here. He says, I'll give you my Spirit. And the evidence of that is that I will make my word to be in your mouth. And that's how the Lord has blessed us in our church here. Uh, you, you know the people that uh, they think is having the spirit when they get to their meetings? No Bible. No scripture. No interpretation of scripture. No application of scripture. You know somebody, everybody stands up and they may sing for one hour and wave and dance and somebody then jumps up and then begins to run around. They say, praise the Lord, the Spirit of God has come. And then everybody, you know, they are singing and dancing, holding one another. And they have some kind of emotional feeling. And they say that that is the evidence that the Spirit of God is in their midst, my brothers and sisters. The evidence that the Spirit of God is there is that the scripture has a central place, valuable, indispensable, important, influential in the midst of the people. The scripture and the spirit, always in agreement. Where the spirit is, the scripture will be there. Where the scripture is not there, the spirit is not there in its fullness. You know, there are some people that think that, you know, if the Spirit of God is there, the way they will know is that you'll be able to say, that's a witch, that's a sorcerer, come on here. Show me from the ministry of Christ. Because Jesus Christ had the fullness of the Spirit without measure. Show me one time where Jesus said, Peter, be careful, that's a witch there. Matthew, take care, that's a wizard there. Philip, open your ears now. That fellow has familiar spirit. The spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. And that's what we're emphasizing to you. There is agreement between the spirit and the scripture. And you look at the apostles. How much time did they spend identifying witches and wizards? When those people showed up and they had evil spirit, in one word, they cast out the spirit and then they keep on preaching. The central thing, the significant thing that shows that we have the Spirit of God in our midst is the abundance of Scripture, the teaching of the Scripture. We're told in Second, in second Peter, Second Peter, chapter 1, verses 20 and 21, it says, Knowing this first, that no prophecy of the Scripture is of any private interpretation. For the prophecy came not in all time by the will of man, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. Hey, that is it. That's what the Lord is telling us. In John chapter 16, 
John chapter 16 and in verse 13. How be it when he, the spirit of truth, is come. When he, the spirit of truth, when he is come, he will do what? Guide you into what? Tell me out loud. Why do we go into all these areas? Why will somebody having the spirit of God get tired of studying the Bible? Brother, we don't see you anymore at the Bible study. Sister, we don't see you anymore in our church. Ah, see, I, I am tired. Every time. Bible, Bible, Bible. And they will not stop. And they keep on reading and reading and reading. I discovered a place. I'm telling you. The Holy Spirit is just mightily present in that place. And, and they don't concentrate on studying the Bible, studying the Bible, studying the Bible. Because, you know, I, I stopped... When I was in deeper life, we studied and studied and studied until my head was filled with the Bible. But now, you know what I'm doing? I just go to that place and we just relax and we just pray and we just sing. The Holy Spirit just comes in a mighty influence like a wind. And every problem is being revealed. And my enemies are revealed to me. And my problems are revealed to me. And I'm telling you, and they interpret my dreams for me. Think about it. You know, I come to deeper life all the time. They never interpreted my dreams for me. But now, praise the Lord, I'm in a place where the Holy Ghost has taken over. You are deceived. See, how be it? When he, the spirit of truth, has come, he will guide you into all truth. But, and then, for he shall not speak of himself, but whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he speak. And he will show you things to come. He will teach you about the rapture. He will teach you about the coming of the Lord. Because he is the spirit of truth. He tells us in John chapter 14. John chapter 14. Reading verse 26. But the comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name, he shall teach you all things. Teach. When a spirit of truth has come, it's important ministry in your life and in the church will be that it will teach you all things and bring all things to your remembrance whatsoever I have spoken, I've said unto you. I pray you'll be full of the Holy Ghost. I said you'll be full of the Holy Ghost. And when you're full of the Holy Ghost, what will happen in your life then? Will the Holy Ghost make you to be suspecting brothers and sisters, a witch, a wizard, a familiar spirit evil? No. Acts chapter 4 verse 31. Acts chapter 4 verse 31. And when they had prayed, the place was shaking where they were assembled together. And they were all, I said they were all, I said they were all filled with the Holy Ghost. And they did what? They spoke the word of God with boldness. That's the continuing evidence that the Holy Ghost is in our midst. When the church is filled with the Holy Ghost, the word of God in every house fellowship, the word of God in every zone, the word of God in every district, the word of God in every church, the word of God in every community will be going out with conviction and with boldness. The spirit of God is here tonight. If you are not born again, you will be saved. If you need to be sanctified, you will be sanctified. And if you need to be baptized and filled with the Holy Ghost, He will do it for you tonight in Jesus' name. And when the Holy Ghost comes upon you, He will make you to understand the Scriptures in a clearer manner. And then there will never be any disagreement between the Scripture and the Spirit. Rise up and let us pray.